16-year-old man says the longest moonwalk dance at a distance of 1.2 kilometers in Thailand. The management of the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Pattaya organized the Moonwalk Michael Jackson record-setting event in the evening of June 24th and the record setter is Niwat Othon, the 16-year-old local actor. He started a moonwalk dance in front of the Central Festival Pattaya Beach Shopping Centre and finished his effort at King Seafood Restaurant in the middle of Walking Street. Staffs of Pattaya City secured his route lined with cheering tourists. At the finish line, crowds of Thai and foreign tourists congratulated Mr Niwat, also known as Kani, for making the longest moonwalk dance record in Thailand. The teenager then received a certificate from Somporn Naksutrong, the operator of the museum and the Royal Garden Plaza shopping center where the museum stands. Mr Somporn said that the activity was aimed at entertaining tourists and promoting Pattaya City in this low season. The Songkla Community Development Office organizes a local product fair in the southern province of Songkla to present one Tambon One product or O-Top of southern border provinces. The fair includes performances, attracts crowds of visitors and is part of attempts to restore peace in the violence plagued far south of Thailand. Authorities of Songkla and four other southern border provinces, namely Satun, Yala, Patani and Naratiwat, organised the OTOP Fair at the International Auditorium in the Hat Nyai campus of Prince of Songkla University from June 22nd to 29th. The fair is aimed at promoting outstanding local products, increasing their sales, raising incomes of local people who produce them, boosting confidence among business people and tourists, facilitating business deals and preparing producers for the upcoming ASEAN community. In the fair, there are 360 booths of O-Tops, including textile, garments, foods, beverages, appliances, souvenirs, non-food herbal products and halal foods. Indonesian and Malaysian operators also join the fair. The Southern Border Provinces Administrative Centre, or SBPAC, organised a ceremony to receive date palm nuts bestowed by the Saudi Arabian Royal Institution upon Thai Muslims in the far south. SBPAC Secretary General Panu Utairat, 4th Army Chief, Lieutenant General Walid Rojana Pagdi, governors and Islamic chiefs of southern border provinces and SBPAC officials attended the ceremony at the SBPAC at 9.30am on June 21st to officially receive 60 tons of date palm nuts donated by the Saudi Arabian royalty. At 10am, trucks carrying the palm nuts were launched from the SBPAC for distribution in southern border provinces of Thailand. The education and orphan-oriented Satachon Foundation sought the date palm nut donation from the Saudi Arabian royalty for Thai Muslims' consumption during their Ramadan month of fasting. The date palm nuts go to people in five southern border provinces. Staffs of local mosques, local Islamic committees and SBPAC help distribute the date palm nuts. For the first time, historic legal documents claiming Vietnam's sovereignty over the Spratly and Paracel archipelagos have been made public at an exhibition in the central city of Da Nang. Named Hoang Sa Trong Sa in separable parts of Vietnam, the exhibition was opened on June 21st at Da Nang Museum as part of an international conference themed Hoang Sa Trong Sa Historical Truth. The exhibition drew the attention of over 200 scholars and researchers as well as members of the public. The birth certificate of Mai Kim Kui, a Vietnamese citizen that lived on the Paracel Islands, is one of hundreds of valuable artifacts that Vietnamese people have donated to the exhibition. This small document acknowledges the existence of Vietnamese people on the Paracel Islands. Wood blocks from the Nguyen dynasty as well as all maps from Vietnam and Western countries unanimously authenticate Vietnam's sovereignty over the Spratly and Paracel Islands and state that Hainan is the southernmost territory of China. These are only two instances amongst many where these legal historic documents gathered from both domestic and international sources can prove Vietnam's sovereignty over Spratly and Paracel Islands. The world's first vaccine for dengue will likely to be rolled out next year and Singapore may be among the first few countries to use it. 
It is believed that this new vaccine can help reduce the rate of dengue infections by half. Researchers in Singapore participated in the second phase of the clinical testing of the vaccine six years ago. The live vaccine is now in its final stage of testing. It works by stimulating the body to fight against the dengue virus. The vaccine was tested in areas of high dengue risk such as Indonesia, Thailand and Latin America and was used on a wide age range from 2 to 45 years old. The vaccine requires three injections in a person's lifetime, taken six months apart. But further tests are needed to determine if the jab is suitable for all ages. The new vaccine can fight against the four serotype of dengue virus and has an efficacy rate of 56%. And while the dengue virus mostly affects adults in Singapore, scientists are also trying to reduce the infection in children. We are also working on novel community-based strategies to reduce dengue in school-aged children. So we're currently doing um, a large-scale trial in Thailand to assess whether impregnating school uniforms would have an effect on reducing dengue in infections. In recent years, more homeowners are warming up to renewable energy, with the number of solar panels installations increasing nearly four times. But for those reluctant to fork out the installation costs, there are other options. These include an upcoming initiative that allows installation without any upfront costs. Installing solar panels on your rooftop could set you back $10,000. For those who balk at the amount, one company has a solution. From late July, Solar PV Exchange will match investors with homeowners. Investors pay for the installation costs. With the solar panels, homeowners enjoy lower electricity bills. They pay a percentage of the amount they save to the investors for the next 20 years. Investors can expect to get a 5% return. 29-year-old Gary Au is one of the five investors who have signed up. Investors in the company or the system uh, get a regular steady return. You know, it's not going to make anyone phenomenally rich, but if you're interested in, like, you know, regular cash in your pocket every month, it's okay. Another company tapping into a growing interest in solar technology is Sunseep Leasing. It now receives about 30 inquiries each month compared to five per month in 2010. One reason is because uh, solar panel prices have dropped over the years. I think since 2009 till now, the prices have dipped more than half. Two years ago, 28-year-old Miss Jean Poa spent about $7,500 to install solar panels. She now sees a 10% reduction of about $80 in her monthly electricity bills. She has already recouped the installation cost. If we are going to stay here for a pretty long period of time, I think we will be able to enjoy a lot more cost savings. In 2011, there were only 35 residential solar panel installations island-wide. Two years later, the number has increased to 129. The capacity of our solar panels accounts for only 0.12% of Singapore's overall power generation capacity. Despite the technological advancements, many homeowners are still reluctant to install solar panels. They feel that there wasn't enough information available on this topic and that the upfront costs were still too high. The government is also encouraging encouraging more to use solar power. Homeowners can sell excess electricity generated from solar panels back to the power grid. They are paid the energy cost of the electricity they export into the grid. This amount is then offset from the electricity bill. As of April 2014, there are 280 landed homeowners and town councils under this credit scheme. With more options than ever for homeowners, prospects for solar energy are looking bright. But suppliers say they will need to generate more awareness so that more will come on board. Malaysia and Philippines have numerous common interests and limitless opportunities that have potential to be fully maximised. Philippines Ambassador to Malaysia, J. Eduardo Malaya, said the two countries' partnership has been boosted by vibrant trade and economic exchanges and is fortunate to witness a renaissance in Philippines-Malaysian relations. He said that certainly there remain few challenges, but this is not unusual among neighbours. He said this in his speech at the 116th anniversary of the proclamation of Philippines' independence celebration in Kuala Lumpur recently. 
Malaysian Home Minister Ahmad Zaid Hamidi represented the Malaysian government at the event. Ambassador J. Eduardo Malaya added ties between the two countries and the people had improved, particularly with the recent exchanges of visit between President Benigno S. Aquino III, who came to Malaysia in February, while the following month saw Prime Minister Najib Razak visiting Manila. In his speech, Malaya noted the successful conclusion of the Mindanao peace process with the signing of the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsa Moro, which was done under Malaysian facilitation. There are more than 500,000 Filipinos in Malaysia. The nation's Independence Day, also known as the Day of Freedom, is observed on June 12th every year, commemorating the Philippines' declaration of independence from Spain on that day in 1898. This year, the event was made merry by the Bayanihan Philippines National Dance Company, which gave a gala performance before a by-invitation crowd comprising members of the diplomatic corps, the Malaysian Filipino business community, and select members of the Filipino community. This is their second time in Malaysia after a well-applauded performance during the Embassy's Independence Day reception in 2009. Founded in 1957, the Bayanihan Philippines National Folk Dance Company is the oldest dance company in the Philippines. A multi-award company, both nationally and internationally, it is called the depository of almost all Filipino folk dances, dresses and songs. The group takes its name from the Filipino word bayanihan, which means working together for a common good. A delegation of Malay language teachers who participated in the Malay Language Immersion Program (MLIP) working group between the Ministry of Education Brunei Darussalam and the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Singapore visited the Language and Literature Bureau in Barakas. The 22-member delegation was briefed by the Director of Language and Literature Bureau, Dayang Haja Amina binti Haji Momin, who among others explained the function of the department and the development on the usage of the Malay language in the country. The MILP program is a joint cooperation between the two ministries in sharing experience and exposure to the Malay language teachers from the Republic of Singapore, apart from enabling the participants to learn and apply appropriate techniques in the assessment method in the teaching of the Malay language.